Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the channel. Uh, no game this week for Oxford United, so I thought I'd pull a video together talking about how great and wonderful the season Oh, I couldn't even get through that sentence. <laughs> is going so far. And um, for the first time ever on the channel, I have a special guest, a guy with unprecedented knowledge and history and experience when it comes to Oxford United. Unfortunately, he did cancel last minute, so I've had to rope in my brother. We just we, We've been supporting Oxford United for a long time, Robert, so um, we know all about the kind of pain and torture and disappointment and meandering seasons. And... We've been here many times before, but this is the first time we can actually do a video on it. Let's not beat around the bush. It's been a really poor start to the season for Oxford United. I mean, we, we've had it right from the, the almost before, before the season ended, there was talk about how much better the playing budget will be and how much stronger we're going to be next season in recruitment. And so far after nine games, it's been anything but encouraging. But we're going to try and take it right the way back to the start and go over a few areas of where it's going wrong and why it's going wrong. And um, I think the, the number one place to start with is probably going to be with the recruitment um, and the players that have come in and the players that have gone. And the weird thing is, is if you speak to most Oxford fans, I think they're going to say that the recruitment's been really poor. But when you look at the players that have come in, a lot of them are really good. Looking at it, though, it's, a lot of it is like for like. I was sort of going through it earlier. We're doing some research on this, looking at the players we've got coming in, the players we've got. Whoa, 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 whoa. You did research on this? Well, I did kind of think we'd do our usual half-assed thing. But I thought, you know what, let's get some stats about this. But... There we go. It's official. We're using our full asses. <laughs> oh, if you look at the players that we got coming in then, so... Recruit players that we've got coming in, Josh Murphy, Devon Anderson, if you pronounce it, Kieran Brown, the infamous Jody Jones, who apparently has played for, you know, is is an Oxford United player, though no one's ever seen him. Well, the, only a, Oxford United player, the only Oxford United player that's getting his minutes in international football to come back to League One. Yeah, we'll come back to Jody Jones because I think that needs to be talked about. <laughs> Stuart Finley. four, five, and six are all about Jody Jones. <laughs> Stuart Finley, uh, Yannick Wildshoot, Ed McGinty, and then we've got two loan signings in Lewis Bate and Carl Joseph. Yep. But one of the things that was what we were saying earlier in the summer, we were quite impressed by were the players that we kept. We kept Bowden. I mean, he's had a poor season, but if you said to anyone last season, we're going to keep Billy Bowden, everyone would have been thrilled about it. We kept Elliot Moore. We all thought Elliot Moore was basically going to be following McNally out the door. Um, you know, we sort of kept Brannigan. That was a major shot. He was practically on his way to Blackpool before that sort of fell through. And Sam Baldock. So we've kept a lot of our big name players from last season. And... You know, we brought some decent, you know, some players into the side. I've not seen Josh Murphy or Wild Shoot or anyone play yet, so I've got no way of evaluating how good they are. But we do seem to be, we're promised that they're incredibly talented players. There's a couple of really good points that I actually even forgot. And firstly, I think I think it's Wildshut. Well, OK, pro probably. I will not butcher um, the pronunciation there. I actually forgot about some of these things because of, like, the season, the way it's sort of dragged and been quite... One annoying thing after another. I actually forgot that more we thought more was going to leave. Yeah, and I actually like have even forgot about those positive vibes on the opening day where we all thought Brannigan was going to leave. We wake up on the morning where we're playing Derby on the opening day, and all of a sudden it's Brannigan signed a three-year deal. So yeah, fantastic, amazing stuff. I think yeah. So a lot of those players have been pretty good. The ones that have signed and the ones that we kept. Um. I think that it's, I think well, we just think it's the depth though, isn't it really? It's the strength in depth though, what we've seen so far that is just isn't there. Well, it, uh, what's interesting though, is if you look at the players that we've got out and then the players we lost as well. So, touching the head though, we brought in uh, Ed McGinty, a goalkeeper, but we've sent um, uh, Stevens out on loan. Come to that one later we as well. We will get to that one. That one is, that one is, um, one yeah. time we will get, touch on quite a bit because I think that is such a weird situation. It needs its own kind of few minutes on it itself. But yeah. Mark Sykes went with the bridge burning behind him as he exited the club. Yeah. Uh, 
Joel Cooper never settled at the club. Yeah. Ryan Williams got a chance to move back home. Completely understandable. Probably would have stayed otherwise. But um, and then so, but then if you sort of look at those players, then we've replaced those with um, Lewis Bates, uh, Josh Murphy, uh, Vailshoot, wherever you pronounce it. Maybe even Jody Jones, if we ever find him at the club. But um, so we've so we've lost the players and we've regained, you know, and we've, they're just direct replacements. But we've not necessarily addressed any of the shortages we had last season. We were saying last season we're short in the fullback area and we've never replaced those. The stupidest move and the one that makes really no sense to me was at the start of, we signed Anthony Ford. He signed a, a, a contract for the club. We, and which was, you know, Anthony Ford is very much a squad player. I personally thought he should have played a few more games, but he was very much someone who could have been, you know, he filled in when needed. And then just before the season, he goes to Wrexham on a um, for an undisclosed deal. So let's say ten grand, something like that, in that book, book, that sort of ballpark. And you think, why? We could certainly do with him at the moment. We might not be having to play James Hendry in that position. I think that that one that one is a weird one, but that one as well from a player point of view. I think if I, the, Wrexham's quite an exciting prospect at the moment, isn't it, as a club? Yeah, that If he's going to be given for, I don't know if he's playing, but if he's going to be getting first team football to play there, um, I think that that's I, I could I imagine they're probably paying quite nicely for conference standard. Um, Sorry, National League standard. So I can understand that one, but it was just weird, the timing of it. And it's also weird of you get rid of Anthony Ford. And I'm sure you heard something from Robbo saying that that gives us options to go get somebody else now. And yeah. it's like, so, all right, great. We're going to go get a fullback. And we signed uh, Javan Anderson, this guy from Lazio. Very encouraging. You know, you got to get a guy from Lazio. It's all very exciting. But if you look at him, he's barely played any football in his career. Yeah. And, he's, and then you have to, and he's not even ready to play. So he's yeah. not fit, and you've got to wait for him to get a work permit. It's like, what's going on with these players? Which, um, and I think also what's compounded is, and what the, the strength in depth of the squad's really been tested and by an unprecedented amount of injuries, which seems yeah. like every new player that's come in as soon as they kicked a ball, as like broken down in a heap with a, oh, we didn't even know they had that injury kind of injury, um, which is really frustrating. In answer to your question, Anthony Ford has played eight times for Wrexham this okay, season. So he's starting every game. So he's playing, he's playing most games. But yeah, that's a fair point. But is this a combination of like uh, Sam Baldock? We know he's injury prone. Yeah. So him picking up an injury... Uh, Wildshut, is that, I mean, I don't know, he picked up a contact injury in one of the first games he played. That's not necessarily someone we've signed, that's just bad that's luck. That's the one that's really unlucky, that's the yeah. one that's almost like freaky unlucky. Yeah, yeah. But, no, I agree with you, I mean, the trouble is at the moment is that we've not had a chance to look at a lot of our new signings. I mean, we haven't seen Murphy, we haven't seen Anderson, we haven't seen um, Wildshut. We, I mean, and Jody Jones, we're laughing about it. But what on earth is this all about? We've signed... Jody Jones was basically on non-contract terms with us for most of the um, pre-season. Yeah. He was playing a couple of matches here or there. And the club certainly seemed very iffy on signing him. But, and then, at the last minute, fair, we Jody signed him... Jones, he always looked all right. He looked pretty decent. Yeah. And now, when we have got players out injured, we're missing like, you know, two or three wingers. Where is he? Why is he not playing? I mean, is it the obligatory, he's not doing anything in training? Well, if he's not, how come he's being selected for his national side? You know, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. And the trouble is, again, he's all tapping later with Robinson, is that he's always very one for sort of like dropping veiled hints of saying, oh, I've got my reasons for not doing it, but I will not tell you. So you'll just leave us to, spe you know, endlessly speculate. Nice one, Robinson. Yeah, yeah, that is absolutely right. and. and um. The thing is with Joey Jody Jones as well. He, I mean, he, it seemed like he was Coventry fans quite liked him as well. They yeah. sort of talked up quite highly of him. He was decent, and I thought quite a good player to sign. You know, he did all right. He, I think he earned quite did good impressed in pre season. So you know, you could see why he did it, why why the club went for him. And it is baffling that they just we just haven't 
even giving him a go, really. Certainly with the way that we played and the way that every game's been so laborious, you really need some pace and some energy. And even if he, like, is only good for, like, 10, 15 minutes, maybe that's the 10, 15 minutes we need between us getting a draw or getting a win in a game. You know how it is. It's a game of, like, fine margins. He could put in that cross that eludes the um, the header and we get, you know... We get, you know, we get the equaliser in the match and suddenly we go through and, you know, the results aren't quite as bad as they have been. Just a couple more things on the chat. Yeah. And I know we've like, laboured on this, but I think this is a, like one of the bigger things that's really annoyed fans for a, pretty much even from the back end. of yeah. Well, you could even go back to like January transfer window last season, really, wasn't it? When we didn't get a holding player in. Yeah. But it looks like the club's taken a standpoint of like where they've come out and said we want to get promoted and we're going yeah. for a different type of player. It looks like they've taken a standpoint of trying to get more experienced quality players in rather than kind of some loan signings that may or may not work. Um but when you've got when you do that, you're probably signing players that one um haven't cut it at a better level or two they haven't cut it at a better level because they're a bit injury prone. And with those better players, you're going to have to pay pay them more wages. And that means we're going to end up with a smaller squad. And then you're putting a lot of pressure on those players that have got injury injuries to stay fit. Like Robinson's like said already, you know, we, the these players that have come back from injury are going to make a massive difference. But do you really think Baldock's going to get through a season without injury? Do you think no. Josh Murphy's going to get through a season without injury now? Um, well, we we may not see, and it's putting a hell of a lot of pressure on them to hit the ground. Yeah. In. And 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 it ends up with us in a situation where we've got quite a small squad now because Robinson hasn't used the tra- the loan window to get a couple more bodies in the door. We've only got two loanees, Bates yeah. and Joseph. Yeah, and I think you can bring in five. Well, just having a look at it at the moment, in terms of like the players that we did sign, I mean, all right, about at least three or four of them we haven't even seen play yet this season, so we can't make any judgment of them. But Stuart Finlay, the last few seasons we've brought in several centre halves who've we've sold on Rob Atkinson, Dickey, uh, McNally, have all come into the club, looked really good, and then gone on to bigger and better things, or not playing, as Luke McNally's case. But um, uh, Finley came in as someone we apparently been wanting for a while, and we paid money for Finley again, yeah. undisclosed amount. And I would have to say Finley has been pretty disappointing. He's a different type of player to the other three I've just mentioned, in the sense that those were very much ball playing centre half. So to pick the ball up, they would advance forward. They're very comfortable in possession. McNally seems sorry, um, Finley seems very much a. Um, uh, in the Elliot Moore mould, sort of like a defensive brick war. In fact, you know, someone will head the ball away, but with his control, exactly. not it, so much. It's exactly what it is, really, isn't it? And I think that's why you see, that's probably why you don't see Alex Gorin playing in the holding role and why he's trying to pl- like make McGuain that role, because there really isn't anybody who can take the ball out of defence now. Like, Finley's passing is really poor. I mean, I, I do think we need to give him a bit more time. Oh, great. Like, yeah. You know, I think he's a good defender first, and that is why he's here. And, and, and Oxford just need to get a settled system in defence. And um, and then, obviously, so I, I think you need you need those ball-playing midfielders, like, in front of them. But, yeah, it's, it's, he's absolutely, like, he's not... He, you, you, so far, he hasn't like really impressed, and there's a lot of people already kind of like saying he's a bit of a donkey. So, which is harsh, in my opinion. Um, Who was that striker we saw the last game? The defender we saw last game of last season, the um, centre half. Who's it? Tyler Goodrum. No, the centre half we saw at the end of last season. Not Tyler Goodrum. Elliot uh, Golden. Golden. He looked very promising. I know we've used him a couple yeah. of times this season, but he was definitely someone we noticed could play the ball out and he, oh, it was a dead rubber and he wasn't under a much pressure. But you're thinking, well, that, if you want someone to play out from the back, him well, alongside like, anymore. Well, well, this is kind of the McNally thing. Like, Robinson just, like gets the credit for that, but very much like McNally got in and played as many games as he did, one, because of injury, and because the, the centre-back pairing last season was Thornley and Moore. Yeah. And... 
McNally was very much like he's not ready. And it was only because McNally was thrust in. And then all of a sudden he was like, wow, this guy's this guy's fantastic. Like, not fantastic, but this guy's really promising. Yeah. Like he's good on the ball. He, you know, he's, he, he makes some great tackles. He's got a bit of pace. Um, and he became a very talismanic figure last season. And I think that like you almost kind of need that to happen again yeah. for Golding, where it's kind of like he doesn't really have any options. So we've got to play and then play so well that Robinson can't drop him. It's sometimes it needs that because at this, you know, it's normally always too young to be given, you know, given a chance. But sometimes if he's, you know, been given his head, he can, you know, he can suddenly prove he's more than capable of playing his lever. What would um, Vince McMahon say about it, Robert? <laughs> what would he say about it? Go on. Grab that brass ring. Oh, yes. Yes. Vinnie Mac. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And, and again, like, there's, we could probably do an hour talking about it. And um, it, it's, 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 it's annoyed fans. It's upset fans. It, it's underwhelmed most of the fan base. Yeah. But there is one particular aspect of this recruitment system and is completely baffling to me is the goalkeeper situation oh yes let's so, get into this. give you some context last season the two goalkeepers that we had were jack stevens and um simon eastwood um simon eastwood's been at oxygen for many many years and um be, and jack stevens is like the new up-and-coming keeper was the number one keeper last season got glandular fever didn't come came back from that which is a horrible illness wasn't quite as good as what he, his standards weren't as good. And it became a, you know, Eastwood and Stevens kind of juggled the position back and forth towards the end of the season. So this season, we kind of looked at it and said, is that an area we need to improve? We bought in Ed McGinty from Sligo Rangers, who um, we've had some decent uh, players come over from the Irish League. And he's someone we paid money for as well. Please. We paid a small, uh, an undisclosed amount for him again. So you imagine... Five figures. So we paid for McGinty, and so you'd think that three goalkeepers doesn't really work. So one of them's got to go. And Jack Stevens was the one to go on loan to another League One club. But After signing the new deal. Help me through this one, Robert. Where's the logic here? I've done some little bit of research and Jack Stevens has played seven games so far for Port Vale and kept two clean sheets out of seven. And from what I've been seeing on like fan boards and various messages, he seems quite popular. The Port Vale fans have been taken to him. Port Vale fans, if you like Jack Stevens, please put a comment below saying why you like Jack Stevens. There you go. Good uh, <laughs> Eastwood has played nine games for Oxford United and kept one clean sheet in nine. And McGinty has played a couple of matches for us in the Papa John's and hasn't kept a clean sheet yet. But well, he but see, he looked quite he looked he looked fairly decent when we saw him. You know, a bit he's too small a sample size to make a decision yeah. on him. Yeah, decent shot stopper, but you know he, he looked he looked like kind of he's a bit rush of blood, got some mistakes in him, but you know looks a, looks looks a promising keeper. Yeah, so I think the question is why they decided to go all in on Simon Eastwood for and cut Stevens to the curb. Now, I can only think of it as like a couple, two things. You're either thinking that Eastwood is coming to the end of his career. So you're thinking like Jack Stevens had a setback last season. So you send him out to another club to go and get some more experience and then have McGinty in as well to play the Papa John's, maybe a couple other matches here and there and get some league experience. Simon Eastwood goes at the end of the season. Stevens comes back, having had a year playing for someone else and got his confidence back. And um, McGinty's ready to be his number two. That's the positive side of it. The negative side of it is that you've made him sign a new contract so that we can get some more money from him when we flog him. It does seem really weird. Ultimately, what's the weirdest thing about it is it seems like we've sold. It seems like we've loaned out our best goalkeeper. Yeah, I've we've got our best. Our our number one is playing for Port Vale, and we've got a guy who is might be good in a couple of years in McGinty, or might be good in a year, and we've got a guy in Simon Eastwood who's our number one goalie now, who's past his best. 
He yeah. casts his bet. And, and I hate that. I like, and I've always been an Eastwood defender. Like, I've always liked thought, you know, he, he's done a great job for Oxford United over the years. But he's, but he's not the keeper he was. He was always an amazing shot stopper, like, uh, really, when he was in his prime. But he's not he's not that anymore. And, no. and, and, and what are we trying like, And now you're trying to make him into a sweeper keeper? Like, what's that? Oh, I'm watching the uh, Mem- Aegon games last weekend. It was staggering how far out of the goal yeah. he was playing. I yeah. mean, he was literally on the halfway line about four or five times. But for and, what? But for, for what? And it's not doing anything. Yeah. It's not like he's raking his balls. He's basically looping it high. It's going to jo- Joseph. Joseph's losing possession. He's coming back again. So yeah. what's the point? That's the thing. There's no point. You make him a sweet... Okay, yeah, all right. You can... To make him try and make him a bit more comfortable passing the ball out, but you don't want him 30 yards from goal. And like he's like fucking Bambi on ice. This was always Stephen's strength. That's how we got in the side in the first place, that he had better distribution than Eastwood. And also just the fact is like Stephen seems to be doing quite well for um Port right. Vale. And again, you start speculating because we don't have any information. We so you start thinking, has he fallen out with Robinson? There was something on Twitter not long ago, which obviously you don't know can be relied on or not, saying something on the lines of like, Stephen's got a really bad attitude, he's never going to pay for the club again. Now, that could just be utter bullshit, we don't know. But you just feel like, um, you start to think, well, could there be something into that? Just because the fact is, it doesn't really make any sense to get rid of him. If you're going to get rid of anyone, get rid of Simon Eastwood. I mean, again, I like Simon Eastwood. He's been a great player for Oxford United over the years. And I really do, you know, I don't really miss him any harm at all. But he's not the keeper he was. He's, he's, he's on the decline as a keeper. He should, If he wanted to be like a goalkeeper coach for the club, I'd be more than willing to have him on board. This, this is this is like a couple of years ago, though. Remember when we had like, um, was it Scott Shearer? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, and he was just at the club and he was never on the bench. And he was never like playing. So it's like, well, what's he doing? And this is like another like weird situation. The, the signing of McGinty makes sense. We've like you said, we've had some we've had some um uh decent signings coming through from Ireland. Yeah. And by all accounts, there's he yeah, got some good going reports that he could be a good promising keeper. Yeah. And like I say, probably needs a bit more maybe in a couple of years he might sort of settle into the role. But you're thinking, so I've got no problem with the club line a player with one eye for the future. But you just feel like saying, why couldn't Stevens be our number one keeper? Why did you decide to get rid of him? Yeah, and you, you know, it, it needed a bit of freshen up, didn't it? It needed a new yeah. boy, a new figure, a goalie coming in, because it's been Stevens and Eastwood for a few yeah. seasons now. But um baffling, baffling thing. If anybody's got any comments on that, I'm absolutely fascinated to know and let us know down in the comments. But We'll we'll move on from that, and we'll we'll talk about we'll talk about the game. I guess we we better start talking about some football matches. And um, so to just sort of run through it, Oxford are currently at the time of filming this. They might have changed now. Um, they were nineteenth before a ball was kicked today. Um, after nine games, um, Robert's going to furiously see if there's an update on that, but. They were 19th uh, before a ball was kicked today with only three wins out of those uh, nine games. One, a very lucky one, they'll win at home against Cambridge and two kind of battling 2-1 wins away at uh, Cheltenham. No, one away at Cheltenham, one at home to Burton Albion. There was a draw, a very underwhelming draw at home to Morecambe. And then there were defeats to Derby, Bristol Rovers, Lincoln, uh, MK Dons and Plymouth. So, not a great start. And fixture-wise, quite a favourable start as well, which is quite worrying in a way. So we'll find ourselves where we are because we played a lot of sides that haven't been that good. And it's been a bit all over the place, isn't it, Robert? Formation, team, tactics. Where do you want to start with this? Well, like you say, worryingly, we've played a lot of average sides. Milton Keynes Dons last weekend. That that should have been a um, a win. You know, that should have been a, a comfortable home win, and we lose. You know, and that's you know, these are the sides that we should ought to be beating. But the main side is, I'd say, with the the problem with the side at the moment. No, we don't have any win bats. 
he wants to play, he's playing 5 3 2 or 3 5 2, and he's adamant that this is the formation we're going to play until we get our injured players back and then, you know, the season starts properly now and blah, blah, blah. But you're thinking, we'll play 3 5 2, but that entails playing Kieran Brown as a left wing back, which he's not suited at, playing James Henry as a right wing back, which he is certainly not suitable for. Sam Long has been decidedly iffy as right back for a while now. But, you know, he, he, he's not too bad as a centre-half. So, again, touch on to the first problem. We've not addressed our issues at the back too much. No, and again, in, injuries have hampered what we can play. But again, the, the, the formations have gone from 4-3-3. Three, three. We, we tried in one game like a 4-2-3-1, I think, yeah. against Morecambe, which was really bad. And then he's gone for this 3-5-2. But it, 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 it's... Worrying the amount of pace in the side, isn't it? It's really evident that there's no pace. There's no doesn't doesn't seem doesn't seem to be anybody that can like get width into the team, get down the line, get crosses in, and there's a real lack of like energy from the players to be able to like get up and support and get into the box. There's no there's no pace in the side at all. Yeah. What annoyed me. Um, yeah, I've only been up to one match this season. That was the MK Doms match. And what irritated me mainly, you're playing Bodin again up front. Billy Bodin yeah. has not had a good season, but his ball is in midfield. He's an attacking midfielder who can get into the box, who can score goals, who can create chances. He's not a centre forward. Why didn't we play Odonka? Odonka and Joseph might not be, you know, a team, a, a combination that can last for 90 minutes. You might need to bring on, move Brown up forward or something like that. and uh, Or even Bowden for like the last 20 minutes to sort of put a square peg into a round hole. But it's surely better than that than just sort of doing the usual sort of, we'll play a player out of position. But we're playing so many players out of position now. You know, it, that is why we're so disjointed. The, it's just makes me think, like, why doesn't he just strip it back and go to base it? I, I really just cannot see why we're just trying to be so cute with formations that we play. Why not just stick with 4 3 3 or play 4 4 2, for example? It's not like you know, that sort of like should be a formation and tactic that's like ingrained into every footballer that they know as a default setting how to play. Like, it's a bit like a fast bowler, just bowl line and length. Like, you know, that should just be an yeah. easy tactic of, like, you've got players in roughly the right areas of the pitch. So if you need to go wide, you've got two wide men. You've got four defenders who can just defend. You've got two midfielders that one can sit, one can go forward. And you've got two strikers that can score. You One can sit, one can go forward. Like, it just seems to be like he's overcomplicating everything. And, and, and to say, Odonka plays against Burton and like from what I saw of that game what made a nuisance of himself like at least like put like ran around put some effort in um you know you know and and looked like he might do something positive why does he then not play against Plymouth why does he then not play against MK Dons like at least try and give some energy into this team I mean if one of the things at the moment is the fact that we are sort of um, we're down to the bare bones. Playing youth team players is often a way to try and sort of get the crowd on your side. Players will you'll be get more likely to give someone like a Donker or, or um, good, or you, know, and... you know, give them a bit more leeway because they are young players and they're yep. local lads. You're yep. more willing to give them a chance. I mean, with someone like Billy Bowden, but I think by the same token, he's not. He's playing. He's playing players out of position. And this is why we look so disjointed. And we've looked disjointed all season. I mean, if you look at some of the goals we scored, how many goals this season have been scored by a good team play? I'm not talking about a moment of skill by Oxford United. You know, a Goodrum's goal, that's a moment of magic from a young kid and he does well. Joseph's goal, um, you know, the one-on-one -on -one he scored. Mistake. That's a mistake. Finished well, credit to Joseph. But you feel like it's just... A lot of these goals are sort of coming out of like you know by luck or None. I, I don't or think an any individual good by, by Cameron Brannigan. He fits you know fast in a good shot you know, but it's players being skillful, doing skillful things. It's not anything like you can tell like there's been a well worked team goal or a set piece we worked on the training grounds paid off. You know, and I think that's a really worrying thing. I mean, like I just cast your everyone's mind back to a couple of seasons ago when we had the COVID year, 
And we started that season really badly. Like we were losing 2-0 like every single game and every single game like played out the same way. It was like Oxford looked pretty good going forward. They looked terrible at the back, but we looked good going forward. It looked like, oh, you know, you could you could make an argument of saying we're not that far away yeah. from turning it around. We were creating chances and missing chances every single week. We are not creating anything. Like we, it's really, really difficult to see where goals are going to come from in this side. Centre backs that can't, centre backs and full backs that can't pass, right? Yeah. So they're labouring around amongst themselves, and then eventually they just have to kick it long because there's no options. The only option they got is when McGuane and Brannigan get the ball deep, but then McGuane and Brannigan are getting a ball thirty yards deeper than we want them to get a ball. Then there's no width because Henry's not a winger; he's a number ten. Like and he has been for a couple of seasons now, and you've got you know Brown on the other side isn't a wing back, so the, it, it's really, it just make you just thinking like where where are these goals going to come from at the moment? Like because the only way it looks like it's going to be is if you bang a ball up to Joseph, somehow he manages to hold it up, and maybe we might be able to build an attack that way or. A defend, or the opposition makes a mistake high up the pitch and we win the ball and we can counter-attack. Again, last Saturday, you know, our two, you know for, uh, Brown hits a post, Brannigan's hits a crossbar. Not a lot else created after that, really, especially when pushing forwards, you know, in the second half. It's hardly us putting them under backs-to-the-wall pressure. Nothing. It, Literally it was, that, nothing. That MK Don's game was like there was one chance for Joseph at the start of the of the of the uh, half, which yeah. came from them making a mistake on the edge of their box, and it came to Brown, and Brown hit a good shot across the goal, and Joseph was like studs away from yeah. getting it in. That that, but then there was no rallying cry there was no, no momentum like last season when we won when we got those equalizers and we came back to beat cambridge we came back to beat pompey we got the equalizer against ipswich and wednesday like there was it was like kind of like um and even in the games we lost like bolton at home plymouth home, there was like kind of momentum from oxford united yeah. we were like banging on the door we were like getting forward crowd were getting into it and we would just be like picked picked off at the other end but this is like meandering along like slow and plodding crowds just not into it because it's boring and you just kind of everyone's just sort of sitting around just maybe we might get a penalty or a bit of skill but just accepting the fact that we're probably going to lose robinson's view at the moment seems to be that until we get our players back we're stuck playing this way and then once we can get back we'll be playing great exciting football again and i just don't buy it i mean next weekend they reckon taylor will be back uh, mo- uh, two, uh, Taylor might Elliot be back. Moore should be back, shouldn't he? Elliot well? Moore should be back, and you know, apparently Elliot Moore's been really missed. Well, like, um, he maybe is. I mean, he's, might be, he's um, missed. I mean, he's a good. He's. He, yeah. he's I think Elliot Moore's a good. Is a good defender, and he's doing a good job for Oxford United. So he is missed, but he doesn't play. But he's not. He's not going to be the difference between us all of a sudden finding an attack. Yeah, that's, that's just what I mean. But um, yeah, okay. And let's say you know, so we get like um, you know, Bulldog might be fit as well, maybe. So you're thinking like, okay, but none of that's got any pace. I mean, you know, that's not going to address the issue. I mean, we might have someone up front who can win free kicks and be cute, and will certainly contribute more than Joseph's doing at the moment. But it's still not a game changer. We haven't, and, you know, and maybe you know, once we've got our wingers back, we might see a completely different side to it. We might see some more pace and dynamism. But at the moment, it's just dreadful. Yeah, well, I mean, Robinson's decision, some of the decisions he pulls off the bench as well are just like... MK Dons, we're losing 1-0. You pull off Kyle Joseph, like, he's the leading goal scorer. He might not be having a great game and he might like have had a bad week. He, he did have a bad week, but isn't that an adage of like, at least he's getting in there to try to finish the chances? Yeah, exactly. Isn't that like what they say about strikers? Like, um, and you take him off. It's just really, really weird. Um, what do you think about Joseph though? I like him. I think he's a promising player. You know, he's, he's done all right since coming into the club. You know, he's done, you know, he's probably playing a little bit more than he intended to at the start, but he's got, He's scored, you know, probably up three, four goals so far. He's, he's got three goals. Yeah. Um, he's won a penalty as well against Lincoln. And I, I like the way he's getting, like, some little tap-ins. Like, yeah. you know, they're, like, nice little shitty goals that strikers should get. And, yeah. um, 
I hope that miss against Plymouth yeah. isn't, um, isn't something that Slick sticks with him for a while. Like, he needs a goal pretty quick. Yeah. I mean, that was just, again, it's one of those ones where Sky themselves are sending it out on Twitter as a meme of saying, look at this incredible miss. You know, we're thinking, oh, that's going to do his confidence a world of good. But like mm-hmm. you say, he's a decent player. And he will, if we can keep him for the season, he will, you know, he'll probably get about 10 goals or something like that, ideally. I mean, he's the sort of player that you should like as a fan, isn't he? I mean, yeah. we always talk about effort and work rate, and Taylor gets stick for that. And you can't criticise Joseph for the effort and work rate that he puts in. I just going to one more thing before we move on to the next subject is like the games that we've lost. Every game that we've lost this season has been one nil by a goal by one goal. Yeah. Um, every game we've won has been won by one goal as well. So it shows you what kind of a slog it's been. But there was one game where we did play a side banging form, and that was Plymouth. Um, we lost, ended up losing the game one nil. One nil, absolutely flattered us. Yeah. Like, we should have lost that game 5 0. Like, do not let that scoreline fool you to think that, like, we're not far away. We have got to massively improve by the time we play these bigger sides in the league. Because at the moment, if we go up against them, we are fodder. And if this doesn't improve, it isn't going to be. It, this is a season where we're mid table to lower half. If we play like we did against Milton Keynes Dons, we're a relegation team. Yeah, I mean, that's, and, and, that's, and, that's, that's that's the bad I thing. Think so yeah, I, I, it's I don't not saying that we're going to get relegated, no. but we're not going to be any higher than the lower half of the table, and we're always going to be looking over our shoulder, and we're just going to be hoping that the bigger name players drag us through games. About but I'll say Brannigan and Marcus Mc, Marcus McGuane's been excellent in midfield. I would like him to play higher up forward. I still think we're losing out him being. Um, okay. A, a, a whole a defensive midfielder but I think that nobody expected him to be as good and he's playing great and I think Brannigan is like dragging us through games at times. And credit to John Massino as well. Well done Moose. Big up Moose. Before before we get to sort of like the last thing where we talk about Robbo and we talk about his future and stuff like that we're just going to take it back and just talk about like off the field issues and ownership. And mainly is because when you're not doing well as a football club, all the little things around a football club start to annoy you and start to irritate you. Even to the point where you have a photo shoot at Blenheim Palace and you've got fans on Twitter pissed off that they're having a photo shoot at Blenheim Palace. So it's like, Every little thing, like, and every little thing is like Marcus Brown wasn't there. It's like, why is Brown not there? Why is Brown not there? It's like, maybe he got stuck in traffic. Maybe he was ill. You don't know why he wasn't there. <laughs> like about Jody Jones. Where is he? He's in Malta. <laughs> yeah. Like, all these little things, like, so all the little off the field things start to come into question and, and you start to get worried about every little thing that happens at the football club. I just want to sort of like, um, I've mentioned this to you off camera a few times, but the Robbie Fowler situation is quite interesting when you look into it. And again, this very much feels like if I start talking about it, I'm good, you should be putting like some conspiracy theory music up and having like a chalkboard. But just just to interrupt, the, these are like my points of what I just said. It's like, to me, that didn't irritate me at all. But it's just funny how like that's the sort of thing that's the sort of thing that just grinds at you. Like these little things just grind at you. Like um, and I get it. I get it. It's like it is one like well, what what why are we putting so much focus and attention on this? But what's your point? What what what's the thing about the Fowler situation that annoys you? Well, it's not so much annoys me, but it's something that sort of strikes me as like odd. Is that well, okay for those who don't know? Robbie Fowler's son Jacob joined the club as a scholar, so he's just like he's not even a guy uh, reserve side. He's basically one of our youth team lads at the moment. Gentleman and a scholar. Um, all right, he joined the club on the uh, um, as a scholar on the thirty first of August. Um, Robinson was saying that Robbie Fowler, and I'm I'm reading this directly just so I get it right. Robinson that said that, that Robbie Fowler will provide his expertise on a casual basis to Oxford United. Before the Leighton Orient game, one of the few matches where we actually had a good performance, we won 5-0, he was seen wearing an Oxford United training top before the match and he was speaking to the players. It doesn't seem to be any more involvement than just he's an ex-Premier an ex-Premier League player, an ex-England player, someone 
undoubtedly an outstanding talent talking to and passing on, you know, maybe a few tips to the players. Not actually working with them per se, as Robertson did say, he's very busy and he's got a lot of, uh, int- you know, he's got a lot of other interests. So I don't see him being involved with Oxford on like a full time basis, but maybe just popping down and sort of like talking to them, which in itself isn't too bad. But Dan Harris was in charge of Oxford United Academy and he then left on exactly the same day, the 31st of August. And no reason's been given for why he left. Just looking on the Oxford Mail website, it says that I now know the right now is the right time for me to step aside and uh, walk away from the club and take a break from things. And the club gave him a very WWE style. Thank you very much for your best wishes and wish you all the best with your future endeavours. Yeah. So a lot of people at the time were wondering why Robbie Fowler's son joined Oxford United in the first place. As someone at work did that, she did say, um, uh, who doesn't know anything really about football, did make the point going, if he was any good, wouldn't he be playing at one of the better sides? I think that's that's yeah, harsh, that's, but that's that's by the by, really, isn't it? Yeah, you know. but he's got a soccer academy, Robbie Fowler. He's quite um, set up with um, I think Carragher might be involved a bit to a degree as well, and they are sort of obviously set up primarily with Liverpool, but. Is also some people were saying, is it becoming more and more involved with Oxford United? Because it would make sense that his son then joins Oxford United and then the head of the academy. And bearing in mind, the, the academy head, he's been in charge of the club for quite a few years now. And Goodrum and uh, Golden and all these players have come un- have emerged under Dan Harris's reign, effectively. So he's now leaving. I don't know. I couldn't see who's actually replaced Dan Harris as head of our academy. There's nothing about it on the Oxford Mail website. So it all sounds very conspiracy theory. And again, like you say, you should be you know, putting up conspiracy theory music whilst talking about it. But it's these sorts of things that just like, it just feels a bit odd. What are we doing? You know, but, you know, we got rid of our academy head and now suddenly some of their own soccer skill is now just dropping by casually, passing on this information to the fans. Well, to- I, I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't think that's about... I don't think that's a baseless like thing to be upset about. I mean, we will move on to like whether the moon landing was real in a minute, but um, it's um, it's powers just don't collapse, Ian. <laughs> They're made out of steel. <sighs> Going to be your day on this. Um, <laughs> Robbie Fowler is also uh, quite quite. I think one of his main ventures is business development, is property management, isn't it? So maybe, yeah, maybe, wasn't uh, that chance? maybe he's going to try and get that stadium deal over the line. <laughs> Well, this is the thing, isn't it? Again, nothing's really much been said about the new stadium deal in Kidlington. It's well, all been very quiet on about that. But that might that not necessarily be a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. But also as well, we've heard for a long time now about a takeover. Mm. Like a long, long time now. about a ta- a- And the only thing, and I, and I, and I literally will thank the, the Termana Pop, a podcast for this because they've done a bit more recent looking in company's house and they've said that like the only thing that seems to have happened is just shares going back and forth amongst people where and 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 but all you ever hear is like oh a deal's close a deal's close it's with the fa like but why is it not why does it not seem to progress why does it not seem to like be announced that yeah. there is a takeover and maybe they're like you know maybe they just don't want to just keep bringing out oh, it's, if there's no news, they just don't need to say anything and it doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem. But it just just leave Oxford fans in the dark of just thinking, like, you, you, you throw out these things saying that you want Oxford to be a top 30 club. You say, you go through Carl Robbins and say there's going to be a good playing budget and we're going to be pushing promotion. Yet, you know, that doesn't seem to play out and there and there seems to be a lot of, like, problems with ownership and then the stadium thing starts to become worrying because you start to think if we don't get Stratfield break over the line what is the future well do you this is going back a little bit but this is um Nick Hurd um was it Nick Hurd who's um who was in charge of Oxford United he's sort of like uh I'm just trying to think of Robin what, Hurd. what, what year are we talking about we're talking We're about talking the guy about before the Kassam stadium was built was it Robin Hurd wasn't it Robin Hurd that's a chap that for a long time that uh, uh we that Robin Hurd had taken over the football club and that we were going to be moving towards building a new stadium out over in Midgley Farm. 
and for ages it was going to be talked about how there was going to be uh, you know there was regular updates in the program this is pre-website uh, you know talking about all these various bits and pieces and how it's happening and they all went quiet and originally the club were basically very dismissive about it and saying oh it's christmas you know builders are on holidays why are people being so conspiracy theory about it and then nothing got built for about five years because we ran out of money. So, so that wonderful man came and built it. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, uh, the, the, um, I always considered like Robin Hood and like Nick Merry, but I don't know why I'm lumping them in together, as being like kind of like Lyle Langley-like figures from the monorail episode of The Simpsons. <laughs> I, I, I think that's harsh. I kind of feel like I'm going to say that Sunderland documentary um, on Netflix that Stuart Donaldson who took out, I would consider them being on sort of par with them, people who loved the club and wanted the best for it, but didn't have the resources to actually do it. So it was sort of like tap dancing a little bit, trying to go, everything's great. Just let me try and get some money to pay for everything. <laughs> if anyone does have any updates on anything they've heard or anything, like, I would be interested to know. Because, but, I mean, stadium... Or if anyone has that opinion on the moon landings, please let us know as well. Never happened. Um, <laughs> Planning permission is difficult in Oxford, as it, you know, yeah. Oxfordshire is really bad for like getting things over the line. The Stratfield break thing is always going to be a bit fought tooth and nail by the detractors. Like, so it's going to take a long, long time to get uh, sorted out. We just would like to get some. But I just can't help but thinking, and I've got this is baseless. I can't help but thinking that once we get the stadium thing sorted out, that then there'll be, then the ownership thing might become a bit more clear. Like because there's so much, there's so much revenue of Oxford United that just has to get paid out in rent. That I don't think you're being unfair about this because, like I say, we've been burnt before. We're both yeah. old enough to remember how we're moving from the Kassam, from the Manor Grounds, to this wonderful new stadium. Everything's going great. We've got these new owners in. Everything's fine. There's no problems. There's no problems. Stop asking us if there's any problems. There are no problems. Oh, dear, we've got a problem. So, you know. But, but, it, but it's also like kind of if you're an investor, and, and I'm sure there are investors that can see the potential in a football club like Oxford United, you know, only club in the city, relative, close to London, stuff like that, that, but they don't want to throw their money in unless and just pay Kassam. No, I mean, I this don't is want to just be giving another billionaire money. We need to move away from the Kassam. We need our own stadium and we need and, you know, I can completely understand people in Kidnington who don't want Stratfield Blake. That is a perfectly valid point of view. There are cons problems of having a football stadium in there. And to be against it is not necessarily a sign that, you know, you're a NIMBY or anything like that. I personally think it would be good for the club for the reasons that we've just stated that we need a new stadium. And the fact that Sam Stadium is basically we've been there 20 years and it still doesn't feel like home. Oh, oh yeah. I, I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? If you if you don't like football and you don't like Oxford United, you're not going to want a football stadium and an ice rink on, on that land. Um, you'd rather it be just used for the local village cricket team and rugby team. Um, uh, and if you're an Oxford United fan, you would you you want it because you, you, we know how crap the Kassam Stadium is. But it's just that thing of like, if you're if you're a billionaire or a multi-millionaire and you're looking to like take over a club and it's, you you get and Oxford reach out and say, oh, um, can you put in? I don't know. I'm just going to use a figure off the top of my head. You're going to put in a hundred million, but forty percent of that's got to go to Mr. Kassam. Yeah, they're gonna be like, well, no, I'll, I'll hold off, thanks. I'll I'll wait till you till you sort out the stadium stuff, and then, and then maybe we'll talk again. So That's, this is necessarily why things like um the um stuff at Blenheim Palace annoys people because it just feels like it's a needless distraction. It's just like, look, we're in front of a pretty building having our photo shoot done. You're thinking that's all well and good, and ultimately it's harmless, but it's not telling us anything either. I know it's not, but. In the playoff, if we we're in the playoffs, everybody would be would be yeah. gushing over. Yeah. Oh, look at our wonderful club! Look at our beautiful city! Look at our um, beautiful landmark! We're going to roll on to the final part of this one now. We, we've talked about how I think you can all agree the future is bright, the future is yellow. Um, we're going to talk about the man in the hot seat. We're going to talk about Big Daddy Carl, 
Um, and Robert, to start with, I'm going to just say, I think that I have always been a bit more of a Carl Robinson fan than you. I think I've I, he, he doesn't yes. annoy me as much as he annoys you. Um, but and I but, and also I've always been kind of like a supporter of Carl Robinson. I think he's done a on the large a good job with Oxford and got us pretty close to promotion on a few occasions. Um, and some good, enjoyable seasons, attractive football, yada, yada, yada. Um, I'm at the point now where I don't want him to go, but I wouldn't be that sad if he did. Like you, I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm someone who often gets irritated by Carl Robinson and his interview on Radio Oxford on, at the weekend with the um, I Must Protect My Players really did wind me up massively. But I like, will give him his credit in the sense that saying when things are going well for Carl Robinson, he has been played some of the best football we've played at the football club for years. You know, we have really had some quality players. We've played some good football. We've won, you know, we've, we've looked a good side and we've come damn close to getting into uh, the championship, you know. And we are a club with middling resources for this league. We are, you know... For all our pretensions and our you know delusions of grandeur to a degree, we're just a middle ranking player, you know, in budget wise. There are a lot of clubs we've got bigger, better history than we do and uh, deeper pockets. So, well, 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 and also don't have to fucking pay rent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so he's done he's done a good he, so he I, I will say to him that he has done a good job as Oxford United manager. However, that doesn't exonerate him from things that are going wrong, that mistakes have been made. This feeds back to last season where we did have problems in the side. For all the fact that we looked good going forward, we were weak at the back. We didn't have proper fullbacks. Sam Long is a centre half who's been playing, who's moved to become a half decent centre to a half decent right back. We still don't have, we have Seddon, who's kind of like, I don't know if he was the player who wasn't playing because of unknown reasons for. Um, but he was like someone. Seddon was a weird, such a weird player because, like, I don't think he's like necessarily terrible or anything like that. I, I think he's a perfectly fine player. He gets like unfair criticism um, a lot of the time. Incidentally, Sean Clare playing right back for Charlton, and he's one of their best players now. Apparently, um, just trying to throw that out there. Right. Um, what's weird is it seemed that Robinson was. Completely um, checked out with Seddon. Like, yeah. don't need him anymore. Almost to the point, don't need him. And now it seems like he's like the only guy that's going to play left back, left wing back. I think the problem was, I think, again, we didn't address some of the problems. And this, again, fills back into the recruitment. Is that we had problems. We think we need a right back. We need a left back. We need, Those were sort of like players that we needed to get signed. And we didn't get them replaced. You know, so we are now suddenly struggling for um, uh, in those areas. And this is something that he knew about. And now whether his hands have been tied because of recruitment issues, because when he was talking about the funding, I was having a quick count up of the players that we've got coming in and went going out. And it's about par. I mean, we lost about eight or nine players. And we got about eight players coming in as well. So we didn't increase the squad size. It, we, a lot of cases just replaced like for like, effectively, yeah. different players who just came into... Um, Mark Sykes went out, Lewis Bates came in. So Odd loan players as well. I mean, Lewis Bates, I don't mind it. I, you, know, you need to give him a bit more time. You know, people like to just think these players, yeah. they like to like just make their decisions on these players after like two games. He needs a bit more time. But again, it just, I just, I can't understand why we didn't get more loan players in. No. Like, even like... if you, you could even do six month loans. Get, I mean, get... You know, this is one of the things. Someone says McNally's not playing for Burnley at the moment. Could we not have got McNally back on for that? I mean, again, did we not try? I mean, maybe we you did. Don't know. I mean, that's a difficult one, isn't it? Like, and some of that is just like fantasy manager yeah. stuff, isn't it? Of like, yeah. you know, oh, well, he's not playing, so why don't we get him? They probably might have asked, and maybe Burnley just said, well, we want to keep him in our development for X amount of time, maybe in a year. Maybe in six months. Maybe maybe in the transfer. Maybe in the transfer window in in January. Maybe there might be chance to get Manali back. Um, 
I think he, I mean, he did say they did say that. Like, I mean, how much stock do you put in the fact of like? I mean, Oxford did sign. It did seem that like Carl Robinson was frustrated at the window that um, there were players that we didn't get that we thought we might get and they didn't come yeah. or whatever reason. But what stock do you put in the fact of like it's a weird year with the World Cup and sides do want to keep their players rather than loan them out? Possibly, but other clubs still seem to be signing loaning players and getting clean sores, don't they? I mean, the thing you not think sometimes is on the flip side of that, do you not think Robbo thinks like, well, let's not bring in players for the sake of it that can't make the side better? Um, We're just wasting wage and wasting budget on them. I agree with that. That's a perfectly that. That's logical. And with Robinson himself, I think the question he comes down with all these things is when you're winning, you can find Robinson a much more engaging character. When we're losing and he's repeating the phrase, I must protect my player, like he's playing some sort of obscene drinking game with people. It just feels like it, it just completely does your head in. Didn't, didn't, don't all managers do that, though? Like, I, like, again, didn't, didn't Atkin, like even going back to like Atkins, wasn't he like annoyingly yeah. stubborn? And... We were both incredibly credulous about Appleton when he first started. Yeah, you know, like, Wilder, was, Wilder yeah. Was, was stubborn, like yeah. Jim Smith was incoherent. But, you know... <laughs> <laughs> That's potentially liable. <laughs> like Jim Smith would come on and we'd lost, and he didn't know the players' names, and you're like, okay, maybe that's why we lost. Um, I just but... think, I, just, I think again, the same thing with like the the point is though with Robinson is like that's we really, obviously we're not winning, so we're finding fault with everything, and he sort of made that point himself in the um, Oxford Mail this weekend. He was saying like um, how um, he knew he was going to get criticism, uh, you know, but it does almost feel like we've put our season on hold until we get our players back. It just feels very much like we've just decided, you know what, we're fucked. What we're going to have to do now is we're going to have to basically grind whatever results we can in because we've got no chance until these players come back. Once we get these players back, we'll be fine. As opposed to like say, this is a great opportunity for the likes of Odonka. This is a great opportunity for the likes of Spazov. This is a great opportunity for the likes of Goldin to actually get some games and sort of like prove themselves. You know, you might even say to these lads, you weren't probably going to play very much this season. You set yourself now. You could probably be, you know, you might force and, yourself into my reckoning. And and you could do like a rallying cry like we did against Rotherham last season when we had all those players out with COVID and, and you kind of had everybody playing a bit of a square peg in a round hole. Yeah. But they put in a hell of a shift. They got a nil-nil draw and the fans like were right behind them. Yeah. Like, like you, you can really do that kind of. Yeah, what you said, exactly what you said. You know, you could you could really shine the light on these young kids and really like get the get a lot get the crowd kind of infused to go and watch them. And uh, and I I just can't help but think that like he's saying that these players are going to come back, but it's like they're not all going to come back in and be able to play ninety minutes. You, you, these you're not. If we don't get any injuries through the whole of October, we might have a good side in November. And then you've still got Yannick Vildship to maybe come back maybe at the start of the new year. Like, I think the thing is that everything is all connected with everything else, though, isn't it? Well, we've sort of seen that as we sort of we split everything into topics, but everything is all tying into each other. In fact, Robinson, we're getting annoyed with the players that Robinson have played because you know, not all of them have been fit. Some of them have been a bit injury prone. We're not quite happy with like some of the for- the formation he's playing. We're not happy with necessary the fact he's not you know he's playing players at a position when he could be playing youth team players instead. But also, and fans are not happy because the fact is we haven't recruited players into the side. We thought, and then the question is, is that down to Robinson? Robinson has a lot of control of this football club. He's not just a manager. He's not, just, he's not just someone there who has to strike. You know, he's just he's he's given his opinion and told this is who we're signing. He's making a lot of the calls himself. He's got a lot of say in various different departments. He's even involved slightly with the women's team, I think, you know, in sort of like sort of wanting to be involved in that. But in some sides, when you're winning, looks very good that we've got someone who wants to be a really big part of the club. But other sides, it feels like, saying, are you spreading yourself too thin? Or are we losing out on some of these players that we could be signing because we don't have like a director of football who yeah. can try and help see these things over the line? What, what, which is kind of like thinking of like, which is why I just kind of think Robbo's really not going to be interested in like any other job because he's got so much control here at Oxford United. 
Like, well, it doesn't really feel like there's much pressure. I mean, again, you don't hear anything from the board, which is the problem. You don't feel like there's much pressure coming from the boardroom. Uh, by the way, Anthony Ford scored for Wrexham today. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, I mean, again, just to say it, I mean, when a team's not playing well and you're not winning, there's not really a lot to get um, happy about. Fans, Aya, always is going to turn to the manager. The ones who don't like Robinson are always going to shout the loudest, um, scream the loudest on Twitter and social media. I don't know necessarily, be interested to know if there was a poll of every Oxford United fan, how many would want Robbo to stay and how many want to go. I get the feeling it would be around maybe a, maybe a third would want him out at this point. I think it's probably a lot of fans, and again, leave your comments, Different. But who are kind of sort of the view of like saying, he's in, he, he's in nearing his last chance saloon. You kind of feel like saying that at the moment, we're saying like, um, you need to start turning things around. You can't just keep saying we're screwed because of injuries. You've got to try and find a way to get, get results. You've got to try and find ways to sort of get the team performing. And we're not doing that at the moment. Even though that, like I say, some of the performances we put in have been shocking. We've not looked like getting anything out of the games at the moment. It almost feels like, you know, we almost like say, well, we can't do anything at the moment. So we'll try and see if we can get a bit lucky and try and, you know, and get a couple of draws before our big team players have come back. Were you thinking, which I'm sure he's not doing, but that's kind of how it feels. Are you, at the moment, are you Robbo out or Robbo in? Robbo in, I would say. I think at this stage at the moment, he's got enough credit in the bank where we would say he needs time. I would say we look at it again January. If we have a bad run of form yeah. and in, in like in the start of the year, we are in the near the relegation zone. We really need to have a decision. Uh, uh, where I, I, th- I think if you in. get to, I reckon if you get to the start of December, and Oxford are in a relegation fight, I reckon you're going to start to hear some Robinson out chants. Yeah, I would say that. So, even, I mean, and it may even be before. I may even be being too generous to him there. But I'm also in the Robinson in camp. I hope that you can turn it around. I'm just gonna just to end this now, um, and just to just to send you off with a real positive note. Um, let's run through the fixtures in October and see how many wins we're going to get. Robert, Charlton away, 1st of October. Charlton, not in good form. Lost today, only two wins this season. Haven't kept many clean sheets. I'm going to say a draw with that one. I have a sneaky feeling Ox are going to win that game. I don't know why. I just have a feeling going to come back. Yeah, we're going to, we, I think we're going we've to get had a couple a, of weeks off and then, yeah. I have a feeling we're going to get a 2-2, two, two, like 3-2, three, 2-1 two, two, win. I don't know why I'm going to so many goals. 2-1, that seems to be about it. Um, but I think Ox will win at Wickham at home. A defeat. I think we'll lose. Yeah, 2-0, I reckon. Yeah. yeah. They'll, do, they'll get a goal and they'll do what they do and everyone will talk about how crap, how horrible and awful it is, but... I tell you what, they win games, um, but they didn't today. They lost to Sheffield Wednesday. Um, Exeter away defeat. Yeah, I think we'll lose that one as well. Um, everyone will look at that one as a game we should win, and um, I think I can just see us coming unstuck there. Um, Peterborough at home draw. I think that might be. I can see that one being a draw. But Portsmouth away defeat. And Bolton away. Defeat. So, four points in October, folks, from one, two, three. Was that seven games? Six games. Four points out of 18. Boy, yeah. So, but from there, and just saying it, you can turn it around. Of course you can. Nottingham Forest fans, if you'd have asked them even later on in the season... Um, when they were rock bottom, when Cooper took over, would you you be in the Premiership next season? None of them would have believed you. None, no. Of, no Forest fan would have thought that. So you can turn it around quickly. Obviously, we might have a much better. You never that these games. You never know. You know, you're not expecting to beat Peterborough. You're not expecting to beat Wickham or Portsmouth. They might get a man sent off after a minute. So we yeah. might be able to like nick a nil nil draw. But um. You don't know what crisis they might get. They might have a problem situation yeah. that comes on. And they, must, they might have one of those shit. Like, look at Plymouth. Plymouth should have buried us. We could have come out of a one-one draw in that game. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but anyway, but even if, 
these things can turn around and you can go on insane runs, but it will take some if Oxford are, are only picking up four points from these games, bearing in mind November's fixtures are probably going to be darn tough too. Um it's gonna take a heck of an effort to pull it around, isn't it? It's gonna be you're wow. going to need to go on an outstanding runner form. You're going to need to sort of really sort of be on one of those, which we have hit in the past, where yeah. like we win something like five or six on the spin, you know, literally going on a bun beat and run. But again, you sort of like, um, at the moment, it doesn't look likely. But things like you say, things can change. We win two games in a row, and then suddenly we score a couple of goals in those matches. We're going to start to feel a bit more confident. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? If we, if even if we'd have just... That, that MK Don's game. I mean, it was a shite game. That but like that, re- that, you know, that really sort of did sliding doors that, moment, yeah. really, didn't you? Where Brown hit the post, Brannigan hit the post. Thirty seconds later, we're picking the ball out of our own net. But even if Brannigan had scored, it still wouldn't have been a good half. No, 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 no. no. We're no. not saying that. But it's like it, 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 it's like that. That could have been easily a two-one win for Oxford in a in a garbage game. Um, and then it's like everything just looks a little bit rosier. Yeah, that's fair enough. Because it's still like you know you look at these you look at these things of like the league table, very close. You win a couple of games, you're all of a sudden you're thinking we're in the play- we could get in the playoffs. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. So, right, that's it. Thank you for anybody that's listened to this. Um, please, thank you for the, for the support so far on the channel. My my good brother Robert, thank you very much. No problem. Um, Any time. There is another brother out there. Maybe we might have to if we can if we can get him out of the attic and get him away from that bucket of fish heads that we feed him. Then maybe we can get him on. One brother of these. Hugo. <laughs> That's it. Um, love the Simpsons references, by the way. And uh, yeah, thank you for supporting the channel. Uh, if you can hit like, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and all that jazz. And uh, maybe we'll come back next time in a month's time. Maybe because maybe we can make this a regular thing. Maybe we can make it a podcast. Who knows? Probably not. But <laughs> um, again, thank you for listening to us waffle on. I'm sure you'll have comments. Leave them down below. That will do it from us. Robert, say goodbye to the good folks. Goodbye, good folks. We'll see you soon.